Okay, Dr. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Chai Chu, who is a professor in the GSE of Educational Measurement. Many of you who are students have taken her classes. Um, <clears throat> uh, she, and uh, Chai, from my yeah. perspective, does a good, really important work in that um, she's trying to bring rigorous um, psychometric analysis to address practical problems. Um, and oftentimes that means working in areas where we don't have countless people participating. So she's trying to work on figuring out ways to, um, to bring psychometrics into classrooms to support um, interesting problems. So let, I will just turn it over to Chai and uh, welcome. Thank you, Drew. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I, uh, I'm Jai Cho and a soci associate professor in the GSE. And um, this is the first time I presented, present my work after being here for more than 10 years. So um, I think it's time to let people know what I've been doing. So what I'm going to present today is part of my uh, NSF grant project and the title several terms and concepts that I have to um, I have to explain first before we can understand what is going on. So for example, what is, um, what is non-parametric and what is a CD and what is a CAT and what is a CD CAT. So I'm going to give a little introduction um, to all these little terms. Okay, so let's start with um, CD. CD stands for cognitive diagnosis. And this is a research area that I have been working on. So in the past several decades, CD has emerged as a new approach to educational measurement. So this is a pretty new area and it seeks to um, combine rigorous psychometrics with a formatic assessment in uh, education. So um, I guess people are probably more familiar with say CTT and IRT, classical test theory and item response theory. And they are are mainly used to rank students. So let's say you and I, we both score, let's say, we both got 60 on an exam. So in terms of CTT and IRT, it means we have the same or pretty much the same abilities. However, if you think about that, just because we both scored um, 60, it doesn't necessarily mean that what you know and what I know are identical. So we want to look into the details on what is going on, whether what 60 means and whether it means that um, students have the same skills or they still, um, they, they have different skills. So that's um, what we want to know. So it targets the mastery and the non-mastery of the instructional content and it aims it also aims to provide immediate feedback to students on their strengths and the weaknesses in terms of skills learned and the skills needing study. So, um, CAT. CAT actually stands for computerized adaptive testing. Um, so there are at, the, at least the two advantages of using um, a CAT system compared to the traditional paper and pencil tests. So we will use shorter tests and therefore less burdening to examines and we will have more accurate measurement. So these are the two um, big advantages of using a CAT. And these goals achieved by administering the best, um, the items most appropriate for each examine according to his or her ability. So 
just because that, like the example I took earlier, we, we both got 60, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the best items for us are the same. So we have to consider, we have to take into consideration the skills they know or they don't know. So a fast and a computationally inexpensive item selection algorithm is the key to the success of a CAT algorithm. So CD CAT is essentially um, a, a CD assessment that is administered in a CAT um, system. So that's basically what um, CD CAT means. Okay, so um, before we talk about non-parametric CD CAT, we have to talk about parametric CD CAT first, because this is an area that has been well researched. So we will have to talk about it first. So um, to implement a parametric CD CAT, first, we have to select a CD model. Uh, we call it CDM. We have to select the model and estimate item parameters using a large data set. So this step, this step is called calibration. So we need to do calibration first. And then based on the estimated item parameters, we choose the best items for each examine by optimizing some criteria. So I'm not gonna bother you with all these criteria, so, but, but you know, for example, something called um, information function, expected entropy and so on. Okay, so. You may ask, well, we already have parametric CD CAT, then why do we even need a non-parametric CD CAT? Here is the downside of a, a parametric CD CAT. So CD item calibration for parametric models requires samples of hundreds, if not thousands of examinees. So we are talking about the first step here. You will need the huge, simple in order to you know, guarantee stable and reliable estimation. And that is usually very difficult in small scale assessment setting like in classrooms. In a classroom, you usually only have, they say 30, 50 students. So it is impossible to have such a big um, sample. So what do, what, what do we do? So here is what we do. We develop a so-called non-parametric CDCAT system that requires only a very small calibration sample or even better requires no calibration at all. It sounds very crazy in psychometrics, but um, this is what we do. So non-parametric here means neither relying on any um, particular parametric family of probability distributions or nor on any um, parametric statistical model. So you do not need to specify a model and, and don't have to worry about probability distribution. So the, um, the method presents present here um, today are original developments tailored to the specific needs of CDCAT uh, for small scale educational settings. And they are not adaptations or extensions of um, previously available non-parametric approaches to cognitive diagnosis or CDCAT. Okay, so now we have some basic understanding about all these terms. So I'm going to give the outline of today's talk. So first I will review some key technical concepts of cognitive diagnosis. And I, I will also give a very brief review of parametric CD CAT that we use in our studies. And then I will present two um, non-parametric item selection methods. So it just gives you a um, Heads up, they are called MPC, sorry, MPS method and the GMPS method. So these are the two methods that I developed um, using my, in my grant. So um, I will talk about more about them later. And then I will have a conclusion remarks 
And the most exciting part of the talk is in the very end. Um, I'm going to demonstrate the um, interactive web app that we developed in order to implement these two um, CDCAT uh, algorithms to my own statistical course. So I'm going to show you how that um, web app looks like. So let's get started. So CD, CD terminology refers to skills or specific knowledge, aptitude, or anything, any cognitive, uh, cognitive characteristic required to perform some tasks. So collectively, they are called attributes. So you will hear me talking about attributes over and over. So that's something that we want to measure. And attributes can be mastered. When they are mastered, we denote them as some one or now mastered that it's zero. And usually we are interested in a bunch of attributes and they are um, collected in a profile called attribute profile. So an attribute profile consists of vectors of zeros and ones. So you can imagine that each person has a attribute profile and these attribute profiles tells us what are the skills that these student masters, masters and what are the skills that um, this student um, has not yet mastered. So, so that's um, everybody has an attribute profile and that's something that we want to estimate. So the ultimate goal of CD is to assign examinees to their proficiency class based on the observed item responses. So this is as why later on. So if you hear me saying why, it means these are the data that we collect. Okay, so this is a CD. And specifically, I'm going to tell you a little bit about notations so that you can understand what I'm you know, talking about later on. So suppose that we are interested in K, capital K binary attributes. So we have K attributes that we want to measure and the attribute profile of an examinee is denoted as alpha, um, which has K entries. So again, you will hear me saying alpha over and over and over. So alpha, alpha is the um, parameter that we want to estimate. And so these um, alphas are either zeros or ones indicating mastery or non-mastery of the k sum attributes. So in total, there are two to the k possible distinct combinations of these attributes that define different, we call it um, proficiency classes. Okay, okay, so examinees who belong to the same proficiency class share the same attribute profile. So if you and me are both assigned to the same group, latent, latent class, then it means we have the same type of profile. Our profiles are um, identical. Okay, so examinees have their own attribute profiles similarly Items also have their own attribute profiles. However, we cannot call them attribute profiles anymore, right? Otherwise, they will be so confusing. So we call these attribute profiles of items um, Q vectors. And these Q metrics here is the collection of all the Q vectors. So it's not a rocket science. It's just a matrix, and it collects all the Q vectors for the items that we use. So the individual items of a test um, are characterized by k-dimensional attribute profile. So it, it is denoted as qj that um, determine which attributes are required to respond correctly to item j, right? So here is an example. Um, it's a subset of the very famous fraction subtraction data so, we'll, so we can see that this is the Q vector, uh, sorry, Q matrix. So what it means is that to answer item one correctly, the student 
need to master skill or say attribute one. Yeah, so if the student doesn't have attribute one, then this student is very likely, is unlikely to answer it correctly. And so for example, for item three, to answer item, item three correctly, a student needs to have attribute one and the three and so on. So this is um, what the information that the Q matrix tells us. Okay, so after, after we have the elements, the very um, basic elements, alpha and the Q. So alpha is the attribute profile, Q is the Q vector for a particular for some item. So after we have these two basic elements, now we can talk about CDM. CDM stands for cognitive diagnosis models and the, these are the two very frequently used models, DINA and DINO. So the DINA and DINO, they share the same general form. So their item response um, function, basically they look the same. So the probability, what does that mean? It means that the probability of getting a J item correctly. So this is why, remember, Y is our data. So this is the observed um, response. Given your attribute profile alpha, the probability of getting um, J item correctly given your attribute Alpha, uh, attribute profile alpha is expressed as this. So what do we have? What we have here is okay, S and G. So S stands for a sleeping parameter. G is guessing parameter. So what it means is that although you have all the required skills, but it still it could happen that you sleep, then although you have all the skills, it's still very likely, not very likely, it's still likely that you will answer the item incorrectly because, uh, because of sleeping. And so G is a guessing parameter. It says, it means, well, for someone who has no skill, this someone still can answer the item correctly because he or she can guess. So there is still a certain probability that this person can get it correctly. So these S and G are item parameters. So the only difference between DINA and DINO is something called eta here on top of the equation, eta. So DINA relies on something called conjunctive ideal response, eta C. And of course, C stands for conjunctive. So what is ideal? Ideal means this is your ideal response if we ignore S and G. So if there is no S, there is no G, then your Y is basically your eta. But eta, you know, ideal, that means, well, it, it's, it, it happens in the ideal world because in the real world, you will have guessing, you will have sleeping. So it indicates this eta C indicates whether the examinee has mastered all the attributes needed to answer item J correctly. So if your eta C is one, only if you have all the skills. And if you miss one or more skills, your eta C will be zero. So that's why it's called conjunctive. And what about Dino? Dino relies on the disjunctive ideal response. So it is denoted as eta D and formulated like this. So it, in the, it tells us whether at least one of the attributes associated with item J has been mastered. So in other words, your eta D will always, want, always be one unless you master nothing. Otherwise, you will, as long as you master one or more skills, your eta D will always be one. So um, as we can see that um, this DINA model is a pretty restrictive model and DINO is a free, free model. So that they represent 
two extremes. One is very restrictive and the other is very, very liberal. So that's some of the ideas that we are going to use later. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, um, Thena and Dino are two extremes. And we know that sometimes we also have to take care of data that conform, conform to a model in between. So this is called a general model. So the IRF of a saturated general model, for example, GDNA. GDNA is one of the general model is expressed like this in terms of, uh, in terms of identity link. So you see that the link is identity and other links such as logit or log can be used to facilitate model um, specifications. So it doesn't have to be identity. And um, we have other two models called LCDM and GDM. So um, we always have to mention them, but they are basically, you know, you can convert one to the other. They are very similar. Okay, so parametric CDCAT procedures. I'm going to use these four parametric, very popular parametric CDCAT algorithms in my study when I run a simulation. The first one is SHE, and we have PWKL, PWCDI, and GDI. So I'm not gonna bother you with what they are and what, you know, how, what the rationale um, they have. So just to know the name, okay, C SHE, PWKL, PWCDI, and the GDI. And here, I want to remind you again, the issue that parametric methods have at present implementation implementation of parametric CDCAT in small scale educational settings such as classrooms still faces serious computational hurdles. So this is something that we want to, uh, the problem that we want to, want to solve. Okay, so after we know the literature pretty well, then we can start talking about the overview of today's Today's talk, um, the non-parametric CDCAT framework. So um, I'm going to give you an overview. So here is, because you know, a CDCAT algorithm um, has two phases. The first phase is classification. You need to do classification first, and then we can select um, item, best items for examine. So the, the second phase is item selection phase. Then we iterate, you know, classification, selection, classification, selection, until the estimation is optimized. Then we stop. Okay, so that's the algorithm. Of course, you, although I'm, I'm, my research interest is this non-parametric CDCAD, we still need these two phases. So we start from a simple models. We start from DINA, DINO models. And um, the whole project, the whole NSF project uh, start, start, started with this something called MPC method. So this is a method that I developed in 2013, quite a while ago. And this is the non-parametric classification method. And the MPC method allows us to develop a item selection method called MPS method. S stands for selection. So it's a non-parametric item selection method. And um, as we mentioned earlier that we also have to take care of data um, in between, right? DINA and DINO are two extremes and we need to take care of data that conform, they conform to a model in between. So this is, this is the moment that we need a general CDM. So the MPC uh, method is extended to something called GMPC. So G stands for general, so general MPC method. So this is um, a method that we developed um, in the grant and um, these MPC methods, there are projects associated with this MP GMPC method. So I'm not going to talk about these today, just to let you know that there are 
some associate project, uh, a project associated with GMPC method. And this GMPC, which is a classification method, allows us to develop these general MPS, general non-parametric item selection method. And again, um, a, a, a project that is associated with GMPS method. However, you know, the value of a CDCAT algorithm is pretty limited if we do not implement the algorithm to a real setting, right? So we also developed an interactive web app that, um, so that we can implement the non-parametric CDCAT to my own statistical classes. So this is the um, web app that I'm going to also talk about today. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this yellow part only, not um, the associate projects. I hope that I have enough time to, to, to do that. Okay, so let's get started. So MPS method, classification phase. So the MPS, remember it's the simple, simpler method for DINA and DINO model. So this MPS method uses the MPC method to classify exam needs. So what is the MPC method? So here is the idea. The ideal, remember what I mentioned earlier, the ideal item response, eta C or eta D, is indeed the observed response Y when there is no perturbation. And there is no S no G, then eta is your observed response Y. So the MPC method makes use of this idea and estimate an exam means attribute profile by minimizing the distance between the ideal item responses, which are etas, right? And the observed ideal uh, item responses, which is your Y. So, that's the idea. So when S and G are small, eta is still the most likely um, response you will get. Most likely. That's why we are going to minimize the distance between them because it's the most likely um, uh, response. So here is a little example. Let's say we are interested in, we are focused on two skills. So that's why if you take a look at alpha, there are four possible alpha patterns. And then suppose I have, suppose I have five items and these are their Q vectors. So based on alpha and the Q, we are able to calculate eta C. So this is, this, there is no estimation here. You can calculate eta right away based on alpha and the Q. And so as you can see that in each vector, there are five entries. That's because you have five items. So each vector contains five um, uh, entries and there are four of them corresponding to four alpha patterns. Now, let's say we collect data and then for someone who observed the Y, is 10101. How am I gonna assign this person? Which group should I assign this person to? What are we gonna do? So we calculate the distance between Y and each of the ATAS. So these are the four corresponding Hamming distances. So we take a look at the distance distances and then we pick the smallest one which is what two right that means this person will be assigned to the latent class one one based on the mpc method well and you you may say well but they are different y and eta are different yes they are different but these one one is the most likely latent group that this person should go. We are not saying that it's perfect because you know real data are never perfect. There are always perturbations. 
noise and things like that. But we take that into account that this person will be assigned to latent group one one. That means although this person misses two items, we still consider this person, we still consider that he or she has mastered all the skills. Well, not all, both, right? Because you only have two. Okay, so. Hold on, hold on, Chai, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Go back. Should I go back? Yeah, just one. So this is without guessing and without sleeping. This is just variation because of the, um, you know, chances of the student getting it right or getting it wrong, whatever their alpha is, their real alpha is. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, this Y here, we, yeah. we see that this Y, it is different from any of the ATAS. Right, but this and is it not is, of sleeping or guessing. This it, is it, okay. No, it is sleeping and guessing. It's, it's because it's maybe sleep or because of guess, that's why it, look, it looks different from any of the ATA. Any, any of the also just the probability of the child getting it wrong. I mean, for any, in any item, Mm -hmm. There is a, if you are a one one, that doesn't mean that a hundred percent right, right, all the items right, right. So anytime you don't get an item right, we attribute it to sleeping or guessing. There is no third option. Right. That's 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 a very good question because for Tina model, we only consider these two, you know, noise, sleeping and guessing. That's why we need a more complex model like a general model which can take into account other noise whatever those noise the noise is you know in addition to guessing and um sleeping it could be something else but for dina model it is because of if if there is a disagreement between y and the eta it's because of guessing or sleeping okay okay good so next, um, consistency. This is probably a slide slide that is very it, it is not interesting at all. But I still have to mention it. It is very theoretical. So it's called consistency. So this is the statistical consistency of the estimator. The reason we want to talk about it is that you know this is this is solely about proofs. But the reason we want to talk about it is because we want to make sure that we are estimating things that we want to estimate. Not like we are estimating things that, you know, we, which is different from what we want to estimate. And that's why we want to talk, we want to talk about consistency. So Wong and Douglas proved that a consistency of the MPC estimator. However, there is a limit, there is some kind of limitation of this MPC method. But there is a but here. The theorem holds if, okay, so you may want to, you know, think with me now because this is, um, uh, it requires some thinking. The, the, the theorem holds if the probability of a correct response is greater than 0.5 for examinees who master all skills. So, how does that sound? That sounds okay, right? If you have already mastered all the skills, then to in order to use MPC, you have to make sure that the probability for you to get a correct response is greater than 0.5. This sounds okay, because if you have everything, of course, its probability is probably not so difficult to be greater than 0.5. However, the next phrase, then, Next sentence here is problematic. The probability of a correct response is less than 0.5 for examinees who do not master all skills required for a correct response. So what is the problem here? Sometimes the probability of a correct response is greater than 0.5 for examinees who do not master all required skills. Therefore, the key assumptions of this consistency theorem is violated. So, 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 let's, so what it means is this, let's say 
there's an item <clears throat> that requires, let's say, 10 skills. If you miss one out of the 10 skills, the probability for you to get a correct response has to be less than 0.5 in order to use MPC. So, M so in MPC can, can estimate your ability correctly. But if you think about that 10 skills and you only miss one, it's very likely that the probability for you to get a correct response is still greater than 0.5. But if that's the case, MPC will not be able to estimate your ability correctly. So this is the problem with this MPC. So if it, it, it is very efficient and effective only if the underlying model is DINA or DINO. For other models, so for data conforming to other models, it is less effective. So what to do? Well, I'm going to put this problem, this issue aside for now. We will come back to this issue later. So let's move on. So let me talk about the item selection phase here for, for this MPC method. So um, it, it's a bit, um, it, it's not theoretical, but it's, it's the idea here is a bit involved. So I'm going to go slowly here. So parametric um, CDCAT algorithms typically aim to find an item that can separate all attribute profiles. So what does that mean? So think about this. What is the best item for an exam? The best item. Chai, yes. can I, just interrupt? I know you've got a lot more to do, and I also know that people are going to have questions. This is really fascinating stuff. So I just want to give you sort of a clue about what you, I don't think you're going to be able to cover all your slides. So, mm -hmm. you know, just make some choices and how, okay. how you want to do it so you can leave some time. Okay, okay then I'm, <laughs> sure, sure. Then I'm going to skip these slides I just want to mention here. This is the discrimination power that we compute in order to select the best item. Okay, so they, they, you, don't, you don't have to keep them in mind. You just have to know that we have a discrimination power here for MPS method. So um, now here is the simulation studies. Um, we have many conditions here, but the, I want to emphasize this. This is the set calibration samples. So calibration samples, 30, 50, and 100, these are small calibration samples. And then we compare our method with four parametric methods. Okay, so these are the results. So we have MVN and uniform. These, these are the alpha structure. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna explain that, but this is the recovery rates of attribute profiles with good items when we have five attributes and uh, uh, brushing sample is 100. And you, you can see that I use two variations of um, uh, non-parametric non -parametric, non -parametric uh, item selection methods here, and they perform slightly better, slightly better than the parametric method. But when the sample size goes down to 30, we can see that these two methods really significantly outperform the parametric method. So that means this method is the good method to be used in classrooms. And let's come back to the issue that MPC method doesn't perform well when the key assumption underlying the consistency theorem is violated. So the solution here is to develop something called the GMPC, general non-parametric classification method, which allows for the development of the uh, general non-parametric um, non-parametric as item selection method. So GMP, GMPC method, I have to mention it just a little bit. So it uses a different um, ideal response. It's called ATA W, which stands for weighted ideal response. And uh, ATA W is a convex combination of the um, old ones, ATA C and ATA D. So as you can see, it's a convex combination and W here is a weight that tells us how similar this uh, eta W is to eta C, okay? So um, 
Then the same idea, the GMPC method classifies exam means by calculating the distance between Y and the eta W. Same idea as MPC, MPC method. So uh, the example again, same example, two skills, five items. And then here are the eta Ws. And as you can see, they are no longer zeros and ones. They have some numbers in between, in between, right? That's um, that's the general part of this GMPC method. And then we use the same Y again, same um, profile, uh, observe the responses. And then now we calculate the Euclidean distances and we have four Euclidean distances corresponding to the four latent classes. As we can see, 1.4 is the least. That, that means this person should be grouped into the second latent class which is one zero. So this gives us a different solution from the solution um, of the, that we, we, we got from, from the MPC method. That's because this GMPC method has this very flexible um, ideas in there. So um, we also prove this consistency, but um, I'm not gonna talk more about this consistency part. I just want to make sure that this consistency is used to guarantee that we are estimating what we want to estimate. Okay, and then GMPS method, the um, item selection phase. Again, this slide is pretty involved, so I'm going to skip it. The only thing I want to point out to you is this. So this is the item, it's the discrimination power that we use, we use to calculate the best item, what is the best item for exam me? So this is the discrimination power. And this GMPS method can even be used with items conforming to multiple uh, CDMs without the need of prior model specification or model selection. You don't have to do any of this. You just use your data and that's it and it is computationally more efficient than parametric methods. However, there is a little thing that we have to pay attention to. It requires a sample to estimate the weights. So it's different from the uh, MPS method that doesn't require any calibration. Here, we still need a little calibration, although we only need a very small sample and it outperforms popular um, parametric methods when sample sizes are small. Okay, so simulation study again. So the, the, the conditions are very similar to those that we used for MPS method. The only difference is here, we have a mixed um, items in our item bank. We have 100 data date, uh, items, 100 ACDM items, and 100 saturated GDNA items. And then we also iterate our Q uh, metrics. Okay, so here are the results. So as we can see that when the sample, calibration sample is 100, um, it, the GMPS method is only slightly better than the parametric methods, right? It's on the top, but it's just slightly better. However, when the sample drops, uh, the sample size drops to 30, um, you can see that it's significantly better than the other methods. Okay, so and there are some other discussions. I mean, there are some things that we have to improve or we have to um, think about. So when the sample, uh, calibration sample is large, the GMPS method is as effective as the parametric methods with a high discriminating, uh, discrimination items, but is slightly less effective when the, the items are bad. Okay, and then in some conditions, the GMPS method tend to have a poor initial recovery rate. If you take a look at here, for example, after we give five items, it's actually not the best, but it recovers very quickly after we, um, they take 10 items it's the, the classification rates recovers. And so that this observation indicates that the initial items selected by the GMPS method 
may not be optimal. So how do we improve that? A very simple way is that the initial items can be given based on the initial inputs from let's say school teachers, because these school teachers know their students best. So if we have, we can have a very good initial start, then the estimation will be more accurate. And so it is promising for applying these um, non-parametric CD and CD CAD to environments such as classrooms where the number of students is small. Okay, then I'm going to show you the website. Do I have, still have time? Not much. Okay, I'm gonna quickly show you um, the websites. So um, I have to, do I have, I have to leave, uh, let, me, let me see. So is, do you see, is everybody, does everybody see the website here? Or no, you, we see the links, fine. just the text. Links, yeah. So maybe I have to stop sharing. Yeah, you no, have to read it, through a different screen because you're showing your slides. Yeah. Uh, here. Yeah, did you okay. see? Yep, that's yep. right. The website. Okay. So this is the website. Of course, I have to log in. Let me log in. Well, I already logged in. Okay, so my role now is a student. So this is a homepage. We tell them what it is and what it does, what it provides and what they have to do. And also we want them to be serious about you know, this website. I don't want them to come here and then just guess, then it doesn't really make sense to, do, to, to make this effort. So if you start the assignment and you will see that we now have four chapters here. And then if you click begins, so um, you will have, you will lead to a different um, domain. And if we start here, then you will see the item. But these items that not all students will see different items because based on, based on their um, abilities. So let me just guess. And then say after, I can only guess because I don't know. Okay, so after I, you know, I've done say five or six questions, these are the output that the students will see. So it, it looks like this student doesn't master the first skill, but this student masters the second skill, but not the third one. And these are the feedback we will give to, to the student. We tell them where, what is going, like a little, uh, very short review, what, are, what the concept is and where to find more resources. Say, if you can go to the textbook, page blah, 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 to blah, 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 then you will see more information. So they, there is a learning, in between, and then they can come back and then work on these items again. So I'm going to change my role from student to say instructor because then we can see more. And so the domain items, it tells us, so for example, for the first domain, confidence interval, right? There are 42 items. And if you want to take a look at these items, these are all items related to confidence interval. And um, if you click on detail that you see what this item is about. And so if you, you can also go to skill list and there is a list of all the skills we, we used. And if you want to see what are the items related to this particular skill, for example, interpretation of in, intercept and slope, then these are all the items that um, use this particular skill. So student, this is not, you know, just a name of a student. And PTE is another project that we are working on because if you take a look at this number of items, it looks like there are a lot of items, but still we need more items. Otherwise they will see the same items again and again. So in order to have more items, and you know, it's very, it's difficult to write new items. So we use this item cloning technique which will automatically generate the items for us so that we don't have to 
right? So many items, we just have to identify the item templates and then the algorithm will generate the new items for us. So this is a very important technique that should be used in CAT environment. So this is the basically the, the website that I have so far and it has been implemented to my statistical course. So that's pretty much it for today. So is there any question or any comments? Uh, any questions or comments from anybody? If you want to use the chat, you can use that as well, if you'd rather. Um, so then I have to leave, right, in order to use the chat? No, no, you're okay, Che. Um, oh. I mean, if you want to close your, I mean, if you want to stop sharing, yeah. then I can see if anyone's okay. raising hands or anything like that. Um, I, have a, I, have, I have a quick question. Actually, I have sure. a couple of questions, but I'm just going to ask one, then I'm going to email. Mm -hmm. uh, so figuring out the skills, right? The alpha profiles, those yeah. are, you know, they start off theoretically, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't exactly know how many skills are involved in a particular domain, mm -hmm. how they break down, whether an item really requires four or five skills. Sometimes you think it requires five skills. Turns out you can do it just as well with four skills. Yeah. Um, so that's all work that has to happen before this thing can even go anywhere, right? Yes, yes. Um, that's a very good question because there is something uh, that I didn't present today is called Q matrix validation or say refinement. It's a procedure that has been, that has to be done be beforehand. So you can, of course, you can go back to the experts and ask them to review your items and see whether these are the right skills for this particular item. But um, we developed some statistical method that will help us to, um, to get this initial evaluation whether, of course, based on data, whether these um, skills are correctly identified or they are some kind of problem. And then we, take this statistical result to an experts and ask them whether, you know, these, you know, statistical methods, they, they always have errors. So it may not be 100% accurate, but this is a procedure that we have to do before every, anything can be implemented. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can ask you a question that builds off of that. Um, so this, the whole idea of the Q matrix and the work that's going on is built on a model of psychology that goes back quite a ways that we can sort of uh, define components, right? And put them all together for a given task. And certainly um, psychology and our models of performance have, have changed as the um, the sophistication of the kind of work you're doing has increased and all, but it still relies on a particular kind of uh, theory of cognition. And I guess what I was wondering is where do you see this kind of work? What kinds of domains do you see this most appropriately applied to? Or how broad do, um, you know, what point do we start seeing a limit of trying to um, conceive of understanding as something that can be broken into these component uh, pieces of knowledge and skills in the same way that you've uh, described here. Uh, so you are talking about limitation, right? So um, there are quite a lot of limitations, but the very um, important limitation is that we should not have too many skills in the same Q metrics at the same time. If you really want to measure a student's skills and you have a lot of um, skills, let's say 10, if you have 10 skills, I understand that in some um, areas, it's, it's um, very easy to have say 10 skills for some items, but that will make these statistical methods it will make them very difficult to accurately measure anything. 
So if you can break it down to say a fewer number of attributes, that will be better. And another limitation of this cat is that, well, I don't know, it's still very difficult now. If you think about how many items are there in our item bank, we, add, we need a lot of items. That's fine. We have statistical methods that can help us to automatically generate items. However, how are you going to calibrate them? If you have 300 items, then you need a group who are willing to um, work on the 300 items for you. 300 items, I, I, I don't want to do that. 300 items, right, you know, work on 300 items. So calibration is still a very difficult um, procedure, a step. So that's why I see that, you know, there is a, uh, this non-parametric method is why it is useful because for the very simple MPS method, it doesn't require any calibration. So, right. um, yeah, yes. I guess I was going to this other kind of question of the, the deeper thing about the models themselves. So for example, what if learning isn't really um, best described by a series of mastery states of, of skills? there's, you know, it's a much more partial kinds of understandings that um, do we just keep successfully breaking down things into smaller and smaller skills? I mean, I, you know, there's just different models of understanding. Yeah. There's um, ideas of like spread of activation yeah. and things like that, that, that these don't seem to capture very well. Right. Um, uh, I, I can answer this question from the statistical point of view because nowadays there are all sorts of models. We, can, we even have these partial mastery models that can take care of mm -hmm. say, partial mastery. Or, and now we have models that can, if you think about that, um, we, we, we have these, um, we call it um, testlet. Testlet means it's, it's frequently used in mathematics. For example, you have one passage and then you have four or five items that are all related to the same passage. And that will create some statistical problem because these items are no longer independent. And if they are not locally independent, then you cannot use all these models that I described earlier. So then, so they, now they have models that can take care of local independence and, and they have models that can take care of multiple choice questions or all sorts of you know, um, more complex mod, uh, um, items or data. So um, there's something that I want to do next because this, what I developed so far are for simple structured items. And um, I right. don't consider this um, partial mastery either. So these are things that I would like to do next. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? All right, well, we're about one o'clock. So thank you so much. You're Today, very welcome. Uh, Zoom. And, and, uh, and just relations and thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. You're welcome.